Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. No, you're not. You're Preston. One of the most important revelations in all of fundamentalist Mormonism is the 1886 revelation with John Taylor. In our next conversation with Lindsay Hansen Park, we're going to learn more about the history behind this revelation and how uh, fundamentalists use this revelation in their church going forward. Check out our conversation. Hey, I just wanted to mention one more thing. The Mormon News Report podcast is an awesome podcast, and they cover the week in Mormon news with a healthy dose of snark and commentary. Join Brant and Jenny every Monday to get caught up on all those news stories that you can stay up to date on the latest Mormon news. So check out Mormon News Report. It's a great podcast. Brant and Jenny are great friends. Now back to our conversation. We have um, Joseph Smith uh, possibly restoring the practice of what we'd say restoring the practice in introducing the practice of plural marriage polygamy in, as early as 1831 right there's an Indian Lamanite revelation where he's talking about and of course it's not in his hand we have very little contemporary evidence from Joseph Smith but from a contemporary saying that Joseph wanted uh, saints to marry Lamanite women and they would have understood Lamanite women to be Native American women and uh, of course I didn't get a lot of traction Joseph Smith takes on his own plural wife uh, in the late 1830s. Her name is Fanny Alger, and that was very controversial. Some see it as an affair. Some see it as the first plural marriage, depending on how you read the the documents. And then he ended up taking 34-plus wives. You know, the count is because of the secretive nature of the practice and the stakes that were so high. we We don't really know how many wives, but we know of at least 33, 34 credible wives. He dies, um, he's murdered in Carthage Jail. Brigham Young decides to, over the course of a few years, um, take over the church, comes to Utah to practice plural marriage secretly. It's still um, secret until about 1852. And then in 1852, um, Brigham's like, you know what, this is an amazing thing. Let's announce this to the world. We're going to be loud and proud about this. So. 1852, they announce it to the territorial legislature. Uh, Orson Pratt writes a book called The Seer. He goes on a public, uh, the first PR campaign for polygamy, and thinking that they're going to tell the world about this beautiful new idea. It doesn't go so well. Uh, Word gets across to all the saints in England. About a third of them apostatize when they hear. They're like, what? We've been fighting the idea that you guys are polygamists, and now you really are polygamists. This isn't fair. It It was a big deal. And from there, you know, then the Mormon Reformation, where Brigham Young is losing a lot of members. Um, historian Steve Taysom says that they needed to, Mormon leadership needed to construct a crisis to sort of unify the members. You know, they're in the Great Basin now. They're, they're gathering. People are coming from beautiful Europe to the dry, dry desert of Utah. This is supposed to be Zion. It's miserable. People are starving to death. There's Indian conflict. Uh, there's polygamy. There's all this, you know, Mormon um, rule following and orthodoxy, and people were miserable. So Brigham Young, along with his first counselor, Jedediah Grant, um, start the Mormon Reformation. They start doing all kinds of rebaptisms. Uh, people are getting rebaptized. Jedediah Grant is giving these fiery brimstone sermons in the Bowery in the tabernacle where people are confessing their sins and beating each other in the stands and they start home teaching comes from this they they start sending two ward elders to every every um, household with like 25 catechisms in Mormonism anything from do you believe in God to are you bathing basically and they're keeping people in line and the majority of all plural marriages happen in the two years of Mormon Re- Reformation this is when we start seeing younger and younger wives because everyone's just all the women are getting married up. I mean, it was understood that this is what you did for salvation. And by the 1860s, those families, those women that had been married off in 1852, all have children. Now their children are starting to practice plural marriage, so it's starting to become a way of life. In the 1870s, the federal government has had about enough of the Mormons (laughs) and, and their strange practices. They don't like the Mormons control of the West, you know, Brigham Young had control of a lot of the trade routes and communication and territory and property and and there were several interventions from the government, you can just push them down, 
there's several interventions from the government to sort of control or wrest control away from the Mormons, and they weren't very successful. So in 1870, they decide to start really cracking down on polygamy. And this is when John Taylor comes in. So now Brigham Young dies in 1877, and John Taylor sort of takes over. Now, he's really famous for what we call the Mormon underground. And the Mormon underground was where all of these plural husbands um, were on the run and hiding uh, because the federal government was coming to arrest polygamists for cohabitation. And that's where you see all those famous old photos of, of the Mormon patriarchs in their striped pajamas, we call them the striped pajamas, the jail suits, the black and white jail suits. And you can still see those in like Chuckarama, like uh, they oh, have yeah. those all over the place. No, they're so. great. And like if you go and to the Chuckarama DUP. is a restaurant here in Utah, for those of you who don't know what yeah. Chuckarama is. Chuckarama is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's like yeah. Chuck Wagon, yeah. <laughs> mashed potatoes, and your grandpa's in striped pajamas. So yeah, so it was this really interesting time. And so you had plural wives taking fake names, uh, men hiding out, they would have their wives sort of spread out around the territory and they would sort of wife hop, you know, go from house to, to house. John Taylor, I always call him, I always say with fundamentalists, if there was like a action figure prophet, you know, like if you go to Desert Book, you can find like the, the weird action figures of Nephi. He's like a buff plastic figure and like no kid is playing with that, right? But fundamentalists would love a John Taylor action figure because he was just like running from the government given a middle finger to the government. He's like, we're never going to, plural marriage is never going to leave the earth and um, we're going to keep it alive. And he had hide, hideouts in the Gardo house and all of, some of the old homes still in Salt Lake have hiding places where when the, the feds would come in, they would hide in, in these places. And it was seen as a sort of cohesive thing, uh, something that kept people together. I would say there was there was fear, but it was more a culture of secrecy and like a secret brotherhood and sisterhood that Mormonism d developed at that time because we couldn't trust outsiders and so we learned to double speak you know John Taylor taught openly lying for the Lord that concept and that is something that I think that you could argue Joseph comes from Joseph Smith about polygamy there was polygamy was the Mormons didn't practice polygamy. Polygamy was gross and secular and used women and terrible, but plural marriage was a different form, and that was a higher law. And the higher law was sacred. So anything that we didn't talk about wasn't because it was secret or we were hiding it. It was because it was sacred. And that's what plural marriage was, the principle, as they called it. So they wouldn't have, you know, polygamy was the word that they could deny publicly. No, of course we don't practice polygamy. Are you polygamous? No, of course not. I wouldn't do that. And that's how they sort of made sense of it. And so you have federal pressure really coming in. Utah wants to become a state. They're not granted statehood. A lot of people don't know that the vote for women suffrage was actually affected by Mormon polygamy, something that really isn't talked about. But Utah was the first state to grant women the right to vote. They were, and then it was actually Wyoming. And if Because, they, because the federal government took it away. Yeah, so, th so what happened was they thought if we give Mormon women the right to vote, they're going to vote against polygamy because they're so oppressed. Duh, right? Yeah, yeah, so they give they like, give Why would anybody actually vote. vote for this crazy thing? And, you know, there's some really cool, like, th this isn't a small thing. All the early suffragists, like, um, oh gosh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they are interacting and writing letters and even visiting with Mormon women. So Emmeline Wells, Eliza R. Snow, these women are like fierce, very articulate, bold advocates, activists, right? They're, they're feminist activists. They're, they're on the front lines arguing for the vote for women, you know, and you can see some of these great, these great photos of, of, you know, Emmeline Wells with Susan B. Anthony, and it's, it's super cool. The suffragists were hesitant about partnering with Mormon women because they felt like polygamy was a terrible thing for women but they understood um, sort of the way to get momentum, and they were right. So the federal government grants Utah women the right to vote, thinking that they're going to vote against polygamy. Mormon women do not vote against polygamy. <laughs> they should have been paying attention to their writings or something. Well, they didn't have any pollsters back then. I guess. That's right. I mean, I think they just were so sure of their position, they underestimated, like, Mormon stubbornness. And 
when that didn't work out, they took the vote away, gave it to the women of Wyoming, and we eventually got it back. But, I mean, it was a wild, wild time. The church is, come, the church is in a lot of debt. The federal government is threatening to, to take away their property and their temples, right? And you have to understand that, like, the temple wasn't just a building. It's a symbol of Mormon resilience and a Mormon presence and Mormon identity. And people had sacrificed, you know, it, it's still it's still a point of pride for Mormons to talk about their ancestors that built the temple. But you could go even 100 years ago, you know, I'm reading about Juanita Brooks, and she's bragging about her ancestors that helped build the St. George Temple and the tabernacle. That was an important thing for people. So when the government's like, we're going to take your temple, Caesar Temple, something had to be done. So John Taylor, he understood, he understood that, the walls were sort of closing in, right? But he also, here he was, very stubborn. He, you know, fierce white hair, English accent. And he had lived through the martyrdom and had been shot up really badly. Yeah, and, and we also have to understand the power of having a martyr in this community, especially in the Mormon community where they're building a kingdom. Um, it, Joseph Smith, not was he was not just a mythical legendary figure but anyone that was tied to that moment becomes that and you know john taylor had sort of an aura about him in in my opinion from my readings he had sort of this ring of light this halo glow about him that people attributed to his connections with joseph smith and so he was very compelling, and he, he, you know, he taught a lot of things that fundamentalists really hold sacred today. There's a fundamentalist folk doctrine. I say folk doctrine. You can trace it back to John Taylor, but I, it's like all doctrines that kind of gets sort of changed. But he basically says the gist is no year should ever pass away without a child being born in plural marriage, or God will destroy the world, right? And this really becomes um, a call to a lot of plural families. They felt it was their duty. I mean... They are having the power to keep the world from being destroyed by just having their family. I mean, that's a really powerful idea. So he's battling all of this, and he's not wanting to give in. And you have other folks like Wilford Woodruff at the time who, I, I mean, I go back and forth on reading him if he was a coward or if he was just really pragmatic. But he, he understood that he had to, um, that something had to be done. So the... Like all origin stories of faith, there's a lot of myths surrounding the story that I'm going to tell you, the 1886 story. Um, but actually, a lot of it is rooted in historical documentation, and which is really interesting because I don't know about you, but as an LDS person, especially growing up around sort of, you know, the FLDS or something in polygamy in this community, I was taught it was weird and wicked and they were gross and strange and they had just taken things too far and, and they're crazy. Stay away from that. And th that they had no basis. They were just out, out to lunch. But that's not true. Their, their story, their origin story is actually very logical. I think it makes sense. And, and I always say they have receipts to back it up because what happened was, um, the story goes that John Taylor is feeling the pressure, and, and I can't emphasize enough the stress and the, like the personal turmoil that he and other leaders felt about, you're the guy that loses the temple, you're in the, the room when Joseph Smith is killed, you survive all of these odds, and then you're the guy who gets the temples taken away, and now Mormonism is done, right? It just wasn't an option. So he, it's said that he had a family friend, his name was John W. Woolley, and Wooly is actually a famous name in Mormon fundamentalism, but it's actually more common than we realize. Uh, he, John Wooly is considered the father of Mormon fundamentalism, but Spencer W. Kimball, the W in his middle name is Wooly. He was a Wooly. He was related to John W. Wooly. He was a beloved Mormon figure. John W. Wooly uh, was a personal friend of John Taylor's, a bodyguard. He and his son, Lauren uh, Woolley claim that they basically that one night they're outside the room John Taylor is having a revelation they they testify to seeing the light under the the door you know and depending on the fundamentalist versions John Taylor basically claims he is visited by personages some some interpretations are that it's Joseph Smith some that it's Jesus some that it's both depending on which story you view 
those exist. But basically, uh, Heavenly Visitors come and have an eight-hour meeting with John Taylor, and they have several meetings with him, and they basically say, you have to keep plural marriage alive. You have to keep it alive. Um, but we have to figure something else out because the government's going to take away the temple, and if they take away all of our church property, then what? How do we fulfill this mission of God? So figure out a way to keep the keys alive and to keep the business affairs of the church. Now, the Woolies sit on this... Uh, they, they're given the revelation. We actually have the revelation written down in John Taylor's hand, which is really controversial because for years it was seen as a forgery or you know something that wasn't real, but it's been authenticated. You say we have it. Is it in the church archives or who has it? So uh, my understanding, and, and we can talk more about this later, my understanding is that the church had a copy. There's a copy that you can see online um, that... So there's a fundamentalist collector. His name is Wendell Nielsen. And he, sorry, Ivan Nielsen. Ivan is known, Uncle Ivan is known for collecting fundamental stuff. And so I believe he has a copy. He, um, John Taylor's family had some of the paperwork, and we can get in the history of what happened with all those documents because I think that's really fascinating. But you can find it. You can go Google eight hour meeting or the 1886 revelation or the hidden revelations. And you can read some of these revelations uh, that John Taylor is talking about these things. And, and again, like I said, just like with all things in Mormonism, there have been various interpretations of that. But the general basic gist of this idea was that he gave the keys to sealing to certain men. And they, it was their job to carry this principle alive. Because we can't have a year that goes by without a baby being born in plural marriage. And, and we haven't, so I guess that prophecy And we have right? I mean, I'm just saying, John Taylor's stuff is backed up. <laughs> and it, there's this fundamentalist theory that I think is really compelling. I actually think it mirrors progressive Mormon and ex-Mormon theories, which is, you know, you'll go to ex-Mormon uh, internet boards or something, and they'll be like, when was the last time that that a Mormon prophet said, thus saith the Lord. When was the last time a Mormon prophet had a revelation? They're just having revelations about policies. Well, the fundamentalist idea would say, of course, because they only have the keys to run the corporate church. In fact, a lot of fundamentalists call the LDS church the corporate church. And the idea is they have the keys to run the business administration and business affairs of the church. And they have the keys to run the higher law. The fundamentalists. Yes, and together we sort of work in tandem. And so... You know, a lot of Mormon fundamentals don't have missionaries for this reason because they believe that we have missionaries. So we're bringing people to the lower law. We're getting them introduced on the ground level. We're the junior varsity. We're the, exactly. And then you graduate, and you know, to the higher law. And that's that's basically how it's seen. And, and it's a compelling theory. I mean, if you look at the way that the LDS Church has run, how it's it's all about business. It's a it's, it is a giant corporation, and the majority, I would I mean, I, I've argued about this with progressive and ex-Mormons for a long time, but the majority of revelations are really just policies, right? They're not, God has not come and descended and, you know, filled up a room full of light, but God's doing that down in southern Utah all the time. God's making appearance to these people all the time, giving all kinds of revelations. So, yeah, so that's the eight-hour meeting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lindsay Hanson Park. In our next conversation, we'll talk about how Wilfred Woodruff, the author of the manifesto, is viewed among fundamentalist communities. The idea is that Wilfred Woodruff didn't have enough keys to be an actual prophet. So he was kind of a, this is the fundamentalist theory, he's kind of a dummy prophet, right? Like, we're going to call him prophet because he has to do this. But really, the actual keys are given to other men. And there's some precedent so for this. The keys left with John Taylor then. Some people believe that not left with they were given to other people. And there's there's outside a, the pro prophetic line. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just five dollars a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview and you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button of course we're also on Facebook Twitter 
and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.